Welcome to Sacred Stories Podcast, a place to explore and discuss new and exciting books of consciousness. I'm your host, Reverend Patricia Caginello, and speaking with authors that have shared their wisdom, stories, and a higher consciousness through their books is one of my favorite things to do. Today, we are speaking with Dennis Patoko, a contributing author to our new book, Chaos to Clarity, Sacred Stories of Transformational Change. Dennis is founder, publisher, and editor-in-chief of Biz Catalyst 360, the award-winning business, culture, and lifestyle multimedia digest, serving as a global hub for enhanced performance and well-being. He is also the founder and chief encouragement officer of GoodWorks 360, a virtual nonprofit social enterprise dedicated to providing mission-critical pro bono services to good nonprofits worldwide. So welcome, Dennis Patoko, to Sacred Stories. Thanks, Patricia, and thanks for that very thoughtful introduction. I appreciate that. I'm, I'm excited to have this opportunity to talk about chaos, the clarity, and my, and my personal experience and being part of such an incredible project. Well, we're really happy, really, really happy that you're here. And there's a number of Biz Catalyst 360 authors that also contributed to our book. So, so thank you very much for the collaboration. Mm, my pleasure. So Dennis, your story that you wrote is called In Search of More with Less. Tell us your sacred story, In Search of More with Less, please. I will, thank you for that. Um, what's interesting is, um, you know, you step back and say what part of your life could be best described as chaos to clarity. And a little bit I realized this story that I'm gonna highlight here for you fits so nicely under that umbrella, Patricia, because uh, backing up to the beginning of the story for a number of years, maybe it's because of what I've done, my wife's done, and the lives that we lead between business and our commitment to nonprofits around the world. But we felt this increasing need to kind of just get away from it all and escape and everybody uses those words disconnect but we really wanted to bring new meaning to them which means let's really disconnect let's find a way to do it and quite frankly in my day-to-day -day business as a publisher i cannot tell you how many articles we've published on people talking about you know putting away the devices and being connected and being present you see a lot of it but you rarely see anybody that actually executes it so we said there might be value in doing it just for ourselves, but to tell our story afterwards of how we disconnected. Now, I have to say we had no idea how that was going to happen. We kicked that can down the road a lot. We kept putting it off because, again, I can use my occupational hazard of publishing 24 hours a day, seven days a week as a reason or as an excuse. But we finally were incentivized to do it. And let me just tell you that happened. I think it was a series Call it divine intervention, call it uh, chance happenings, but it started, I'm going to say about four or five years ago, we were on a cross country trip, not disconnected at this point because of what I do, we can do it virtually. So got in the car, we were driving across the country literally to pick up a cruise, a, a short cruise, but nevertheless a cruise. And we decided to stop along the way to see a friend that I hadn't seen in 25 years in banking and had lunch with John. And as we got talking, John starts telling us about this um, trip he's gonna be, a long walk he's going to make. He called it a pilgrimage. Now this was all new to us. We dug a little deeper and found out John's son died at a very early age, just a few years prior. And John wanted to take his ashes and do this pilgrimage. And the pilgrimage, as John defined it, has been around for 500 years. People have walked it over the centuries. And it's a spiritual trip from Spain, I'm sorry, from France to Spain. It's about 500 miles long. And um, the objective of the journey is, is, it depends on who you are and what you want to do. In John's case, he wanted to make it in memory of his son and ultimately uh, as a testimony to his love for his son. So John told us the story and you know we listened. It was interesting. And since we're world travelers, we said, boy, that's really, God bless him for wanting to do that. And to walk 500 miles, who could imagine that? So had our lunch wrapped up. 
got back in the car, headed out to San Diego because that was going to be our stop to get on a cruise ship. So happened as we're pulling into our hotel, we see a marquee with a movie called The Way. Now, John had anecdotally mentioned this movie. We looked at it. The Way is uh, stands for St. James Way, which is the story um, of St. James uh, way back centuries ago when the walk first started. We decided we'd take the plunge and go to the movie and see what it was all about because John said it was one of the things that it had inspired him to do the walk. Quick story, uh, Martin Sheen was a star. His son produced the movie and starred in it. And it was a story of a gentleman that uh, whose son did the walk on his own. He was kind of a rebel, traveled the world. Dad wanted him to be part of his business, but he said, no, Dad, I'm going to get an education by traveling the world. He did that. He walked the walk. He got one day into it. He was a victim of a, just a horrible storm, and he died first in a walk. Dad found out about it, traveled over there, did a lot of, he was going over literally to ret retrieve his son's body and bring it back. And after spending time and talking to people, decided he was going to do the walk uh, in memory of his son. So he took all the equipment that his son had bought, put it on, and it changed his life. He walked for month or two and met a lot of interesting people we saw that we had the chance meeting with john a couple days earlier we saw that we got on our cruise ship we started talking about it and saying look call it divine intervention chance encounter we're gonna we're gonna take this on board and we're gonna put it in our diary as they say and what a better way to escape than to spend however many days walking out in the vineyards and the villages of spain or france that was the beginning of our um, our objective. And our objective at the time, once again, was just truly to disconnect and to reconnect with each other and the world around us. So that's how it all began, Patricia. And uh, roll forward then four years later. It took a while, had to plan for it, be out of the country for a month or so, and all the things you do when you know you're gonna be walking in the wilderness. Uh, so we landed. We decided we weren't going to do all 500 miles. We just didn't have that much time, and it was a big, big trip to 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 chew. So we decided we did the last 200 miles. Reason we chose the last 200, it was a significant amount of walking. We thought that was fair. It was almost half, but it also took us into the city of Santiago and into what they call Santiago de Compostela, which is the cathedral where Saint James remains were buried and uh, that's the objective of the trip to make it through all the hills and the valleys and show up there so we did that and that's really where our story of chaos to clarity begins uh, <laughs> it's, we, a, it's uh, dennis it's a story and a story and a story there's so much it is you it know? is it could have been could have been much more than a uh, short story but uh continuing with what i'll call the reader's digest version Prior to the walk, we did all, everything anyone would reasonably do. We're, we're walkers to begin. We've done some half marathons in our lives, but never have we prepared for a walk in the wilderness like this. Did the research, talked to the experts, got the best boots in the world, got everything you'd want for this kind of a trip, and uh, trained for six months, finally get to where we start, which we started in Spain, and uh, at the beginning of our 205 miles. So we started down the trek, and again, to give you the quicker version here, uh, we were literally 15 miles into our trip on day two, where uh, the chaos began, and the chaos began in the form of bee developing blisters. Despite the fact that I had some pretty pricey boots on that had been broken in, I uh, just couldn't stop the process. We ended up in a small town in Spain. I'm sitting there with my boots off unable to put them back on. I'm sitting there wondering if I can go on. Uh, how am I going to get the strength? Am I going to let my wife down? Am I going to let all the people down that are following us uh, spiritually, if you will, in our journey? Um, my wife did what she would normally do. She wandered off on her own, went into town. Keep in mind, we're in the middle of uh, Spain, in the middle of a village where the average foot size is about eight, and I wear size 13 boots. So <laughs> our our the possibility of me finding anything to go on my feet was pretty new. 
And I, I was just totally dejected for all the reasons you can think of after all the planning. So she wandered into the village, another bit of uh, chance encounter. She encountered the only shoe shop in this tiny little village that we stopped at. Um, went in, talked to the guy. He doesn't speak any English. He, he was like watching a movie. He was bringing all these boxes of shoes and he kept bringing them out, bringing them out. Finally, he brought out a pair of sandals that he found in the window. And it turned out they were the kind of sandals that you can adjust. They were Velcro. She got me. I hobbled down to the shop, tried them on. Still very painful, but the alternative was to give up. There was, there was nothing else to put on my feet. Um, we did that, put them on, uh, started walking the next day. Uh, I shouldn't say walking, started hobbling. Still painful, still blisters, still dressing them every night and soaking them. And uh, I remember sitting on a bench uh, and my wife coming up over the crest because uh, I was just pressing my feet. And she looked at me and she said she had never seen such a de dejected look on my face or for that matter, anybody's face. I looked like I was just the epitome of defeat. And that's another bit of what I'll call divine intervention because she said that. And I sat there and I said, look, here's my choice. I can, you know, Get out of Dodge, as they say. You can always find a way to get a taxi down the road a bit in one of the villages. But I needed a reason. I needed a reason beyond uh, disconnecting. And that's where it came to me. I started thinking about my sister D. I'm one of eight children. My sister D had died about nine years earlier of cancer. And um, I said, I'm going to do this for D. Not that Dee was a walker, but she was a real family person, a real loving individual. I said, I'm going to do this for Dee, no matter, you know, come hell or high water, as they say. And that's what I did. Started walking the next day. Every morning, it would be hobbling for about 15, 20 minutes until I could finally get up on momentum. We had an agreement, my wife and I, that she would never, ever, ever tell me how far we had left to go. Because the moment I heard that, it would be hard to continue. And we averaged 15 to 20 miles a day, on and on, spent hours walking through the vineyards, the villages, got into some very deep discussions about life, about people, things that, you know, you, you walk through life, you might be with your life partner, you're, in many cases, you're kind of skipping over the pond. We were jumping into the pond and going deep. I've said to many people, you know, when you're in business, you carry a lot of post-it notes in your head that just something else you got to remember or you scribble down here and there. By the time we got it to the end of that walk, there wasn't a post-it note left in either one of our heads. But we had learned so much about each other that we we didn't know. And at the time, we were married 10 years. So uh, that by itself was a revelation. Uh, we got to the end of the walk, a lot of adventures in between, uh, always a struggle, always were using the uh, walking sticks to get up and down. Finally got to the end of it. Um, and there's a place you go at the end. You walk into the Compostela, which is the cathedral once again. And there are a, uh, three or four monks sitting there that have been operating this for many, many years over the centuries. And their first question to everybody is, tell me why you did it. And I can say from the beginning of that walk to the end, boy, did my reason change. And obviously, I said I did it for my sister, D. The gentleman looked at it. And he put on my certificate. He did it for D and handed me my certificate. And I was just overwhelming at that point. I, my wife said I just kind of collapsed onto the floor because I was out of energy. I was out emotionally drained and my uh, my feet were still throbbing, but I had made it. So my answer would have been quite different, Patricia, had I not had the uh, experience with the shoes. But on the other hand, it, it drove me towards my sister. It drove me towards what I didn't know it was going to be more of a spiritual awakening, let alone an escape from technology. Mm. Dennis, it really is quite a story. And just to know how much preparation went into it to be the first day in and in the position you're in, I know you had um, to dig, dig really deep, you know, dig really deep yeah. to, to, to continue. Was that experience of really digging deep and finishing the way that you did, has that had an impact on your life and work going forward? You know, excellent question. Now, everybody says this, but I am a walking testimony of how it made me a better version of me. 
just when you think you are a good version of yourself. Um, let me just put some meat on those potatoes as they said what I mean by that, Patricia. I'm going to go back to some of the discussions my wife and I had during the walk. I mean, uh, we, we, we started talking about family. We started talking about friends. We started talking about relationships. And keep in mind, we're walking for hours upon hours in nothing but unspoiled nature, no noise, no one else coming into our, and, and often we'd be walking for a while with nothing being said. But we started learning more about things that we had talked about before. Again, we got rid of the post-it notes. We had silence. Um, and when I said I became a better version of myself, we, we agreed during that walk that, you know, this is precious time. The fact that we were present, again, People talk about disconnecting and being present. Well, that's, we were defining present with each other and we didn't know it. So we were present. We listened, as they say, intentionally um, without any interruptions. We got deep into certain things that we just, we thought we knew each other. We knew more about each other when we got off the walk. But we came back with a conviction and that was, you know, it's precious time on earth and time together, we're going to approach our business world and our personal world a little bit differently. And let me tell you what I mean by that. We came back and we said, we've got a circle of friends and business acquaintances that we've accumulated many, many over the years. We've got the kind of family and friends that they are just there for you. We've got the kind of family and friends that are there when they need something. And I think everybody goes through that. Um, so we reached out and we got off the walk and came home and got settled. And I personally reached out to every member of my living family, brothers and sisters, first generation. My wife did the same. We reached out to friends and those that we had singled out of being family, we invited them into our lives. And we said, look, not that we've ever had any issues, but my family's all over the world. We want them to be part of our lives. We want you to be present with us. We don't know what that means, but we'll try and you try. Uh, same thing with friends. We also stopped responding to friends that you only heard from when they needed something. So by osmosis or by default or by experience, we whittled down our circle of life to just a good group of people. And I'm happy to say it was life-changing to many of them. Um, all they needed was for us to reach out and say, you know, we want you to be part of our lives. I became much closer with two of my brothers who we had kind of drifted apart, not because we had issues, just because of distance. My wife became closer. And uh, as we speak today, we, uh, we just have a much tighter group of friends and uh, we're just happier overall. You know, it's really fascinating, Dennis. That's one of the common themes that we've found in the stories in Chaos to Clarity, that through each individual's personal um, challenges or adversities or experiences that they moved through, somewhere in that process of moving through their own personal adversity, they started to not only look at themselves differently, but they started looking at others in the world differently. And so many of them have started, uh, you know, volunteering or nonprofits or just being engaged in a larger way in helping others. Um, and it, isn't it fascinating how our own, well, when, when we go through something, we naturally, as humans, want to be, um, want to be of service or help to others once we've gone through something. That's where the word clarity comes into the title of this book because it we got rid of all the clutter, you know, during the walk, because of the walk, because of the, the peace and the quiet, but the clutter in our lives and the technology and all the baggage that comes with that extended family and friends that are there and you're kind of with them, but you're not. And it brought clarity to us in our lives. And, you know, it's amazing because people, a lot of people say, when you go on the walk, you know, why are you doing it? You're trying to quit smoking. You're trying to find yourself. I don't know that anybody knows the answer, Patricia, until they actually do it. Now, in my case, it was, I was hobbling, but I still say the amount of time we spent together and the amount of peace and quiet and lack of anything other than ourselves, I would have come out a different person. Maybe this just spurred me along a little bit because of the injury. 
Mm. Well, Dennis, your story is inspiring and the work that you do in the world is, is inspiring. Share with our audience your website and how people can find out more, uh, not only about Biz Catalyst 360, but, but Good Works 360 as well. Well, thank you. You've done a great job of introducing it. So just to tail off what you've already said, we're coming up on our seventh anniversary in another month. We are truly blessed with about 600 writers from around the world on all, well, I was going to say all seven continents. If, if you, Patricia, or somebody could just find me a writer in Antarctica, I could say all seven. <laughs> right now we've got six. Uh, but I'm told their Wi-Fi isn't really good out there. But we, we're, we're willing to open up uh, a separate channel for carrier pigeons if we have to. Anyhow, we've published over 20,000 articles, as you kindly mentioned. We won an award not too many years ago. And uh, we've taken just a different approach to publishing. We call it constructively disruptive, which means our editorial policy starts and ends with our writers, and we publish what can best be defined as good stuff. And as we say to all of our writers, regardless of your background, regardless of your business expertise, um, if you can write it, we have an audience for it. And I'm thrilled to be able to say that because the audience just keeps on coming. That's the core business we have. But as I may have mentioned earlier, my wife and I are involved in nonprofits. We have been for many, many years, hands-on. We, we try to do the time, treasure, and talent. So uh, anybody can write a check, but we've been hands-on for over a decade locally. And as we got deeper and deeper, this comes after the Camino once again, and some of these long talks that we had. And you know, we said we're blessed with a wonderful nonprofit community here in Tampa. Wouldn't it be nice if other nonprofits around the world, for example, in Mumbai, India, if they could have the time, time and treasure and talent that people like us can offer, but they can't because they're too far away. That gave birth after a lot of discussion to what we call Good Works 360. And the theory was very simple. I want to be able to say to any non any good nonprofit anywhere in the world, if you need help. We're going to help you virtually using all the technology out there, and it's free. And that's how it was. That was, that was the theory that goes back about 18 months ago. We tested that theory and tested it. We finally launched it October 1st of last year. So we just went over our first anniversary. I thought our challenge would be uh, finding people to help us do that virtual work around the world. I'm thrilled to say we have over four dozen top tier professionals two thirds of which I didn't know until we started this thing uh, that are now signed up and helping us. We've had over two dozen um, projects. We've got a couple of live ones right now and I'm happy to say we actually have one in Mumbai, India. So um, it, it was a great way of combining our commitment to nonprofits with the virtual technology that we've got and the learning that we've achieved through our for-profit website, which is Biz Catalyst. Uh, Biz Catalyst can be reached at www.bizcatalyst360.com and same thing, goodworks360.com. Uh, let, let those two sites tell the rest of our story. Mm, absolutely. So thank you, Dennis Patoko, for being our guest today and for sharing your story in search of more with less in our new book, Chaos to Clarity, Sacred Stories of Transformational Change, which is available through Amazon and booksellers worldwide or direct through Sacred Stories Publishing. I encourage all the audience to check it out. It's a, it's a beautiful book. And um, thank you to, our, to the audience for listening today to the Sacred Stories Podcast. I am your host, Reverend Patricia Caginello. And as always, until next time, I encourage you to write your sacred story well. <laughs>